Welcome to Written and Read by, Episode 8, Hope to be Found, by Nick Lamandola. Fred dials her for the ninth time. On each successive voicemail, his tone hooks over a new fulcrum, prying up and stumbling through a gamut of human emotion. Yesterday, frustration, then fury, then outrage. Today, concern, bargaining, dread. This evening, he melts into despair. Joe, I don't know if... You're probably not getting these. The realization makes him tremble. Look, no matter what happened, you can call me, okay? It's not about the delivery. Screw the client. That don't matter no more. I just... I need to know where you are. That you're safe, you know? (sighs) The excess breath pouring out of him overwhelms his phone's tiny microphone and a concussive distortion rips through the connection. He imagines Jolene yanking her hand away from her face with a grimace. I'm sorry, just, you know, call, call me when you can. Curry's tongue flails like a lost sock caught in a storm. Globules of spittle collide and absorb and vault on tendrils and spin and spatter umber across the khaki endlessness of road dust and grime. Her partner hunches her graying shoulders. But it's nighttime now. Gritty hinges creak in the tuft of a breeze, and Jolene is suddenly conscious. It's dark out and blurry. Her head pulls itself back on her neck, like the world is too close to her face. She pats herself down, frantic, but it's there in her pocket. She hasn't dropped it. Its cracked screen brightens optimistically in her hand but she has no notifications. She tips out of her fetal ball and onto all fours. Dirt clogs the sticky crevices between her lashes. For a long time now, it's been too dry for tears. The door to her truck hangs wide open, with each gust squeaking a warning. She must have driven off the road. God knows at what hour. It's nighttime now, and you can really tell, way out here, under the cloudless sky, 
murky with the ancient light of a trillion distant stars. The wind moves across the flat, expansive country and over her skin with indiscriminate abandon. It's freezing, like the surface of an oven that hasn't been turned on. The temperature out here seesaws wildly from extreme to hostile extreme, and she can tell she hasn't been asleep for long, because she wouldn't have made it. But she has no memory of spilling out of the cabin of her truck onto this patch of rocky ground. She takes a while, shivering, before she stands up. Not moving makes it easier to believe she isn't still drunk. Easier to believe she hasn't been here before. Eventually, she climbs back in and punches the on switch, and the truck and trailer shudder out of their stillness as she pulls back onto the empty highway. You fucking liar, her mother spat. Jolene looked up and watched a tuft of smoke curl through her mother's narrowed lips, spinning and slowly breaking apart. That's life, she couldn't yet have told you, way back then. You pin up somewhere intolerable, and then you're forced out, and then what? A lifetime of rippling pressure and expulsion seething with momentum, the sudden drift in the unexpected turbulence of freedom. At this point, she's still a teenager. She hasn't escaped yet. Not for a few years. You liar! Louder this time, but still a croak. Her mother couldn't muster the breath support to yell without triggering a coughing fit. There was a tickle of admiration in the scrape of her voice. This lying bitch, Joe, you watching her? <coughs> Without turning her head to her daughter. She's good. Jolene wasn't really listening. She was lying on the thin sofa next to her mother's armchair, phone cupped in her hands, two impatient thumbs flinging the infinite scroll of her world endlessly upward. All of this probably happened. It's hard to say. It was almost certainly hot. It had always been miserably hot. You could learn from her, hun. Her mom liked to speak on the inhale, so her words wouldn't interrupt the drag on her cigarette. You gotta get out of here. <coughs> get yourself far away from here. Go work for the government. Teach you to lie like this one. In front of the cameras. Jolene would never remember what this press conference had been about. Nobody would, which was why they showed them on TV. She's a damn good liar. You should be taking notes. Probably does her own damn makeup. Look at her up there in that <laughs> room full of men. Not one of them listening to a word she's saying, and they all know it. That's why the president picked her. Jolene twisted around to lay on her stomach, with her legs outstretched. If it would have been her knocking on this door, telling us how them Arabs killed your daddy, I wouldn't have had nothing to say to her. Not looking like that. It had been two men. It was one of Jolene's earliest memories. They were in full uniform, despite the heat. Her mother's wails had rattled the aluminum siding. Where'd you find them shorts? Her mother turned, finally, to look at her. You really think them knobby legs are worth showing off like that?
she'd flipped on her rearview camera, the sun's twirling leap across the horizon would have startled her. But from the womb of the truck, underneath the domed windshield, as the indigo desert gallops by at reckless speed, she doesn't notice it coming. She is driving west, staring down into her phone, and the daybreak creeps up from behind her. Out here there is plenty of dust, but no haze. No moisture to hang in the air and diffract the blasting sunlight as it scorches earthward. It's like a spotlight turned on from off stage. Sudden rays bounce violently off of the foreground and into her squinting eyes. She can feel the heat through the glass. The desert gets hot before you've stopped being cold. Her battery range reads 135 miles, destination in 117. She sinks on the pedal until she's going 15 over. The motor's incessant whine climbs an octave until the vibration through the chassis tingles in her throat. In the old days, there would have been the thunder of a diesel engine, braying with petrochemical might as it trundled from 70 to 75. This truck doesn't roar. It has no exhaust, and she misses the smell. She pulls hard on a vape pen that plumes the cabin in grape mist. Nauseating. What this truck does is accelerate. It pins her to her seat. The windows are closed, but she can almost feel the breeze in her hair. She pulls up behind a no man holding the wheel steady. It scoots forward with robotic precision in a calculated attempt to keep its distance. She yanks hard to the left and pulls up beside it. For a moment, with their windows parallel, she stares into its empty cabin and through to the other side of the road. Two seats face forward, but there's no wheel. This model is new enough that it doesn't even need a driver in city traffic. But they kept the seats for appearances. There is no point in taunting these things. They never react. Still, she gets a kick out of swerving into its lane and watching it pound its brakes methodically to avoid the collision. Her old truck won't do well at this higher speed. Range reads 120, destination in 116. Reluctantly, she slows down. It was quiet. There was nobody in the store, it felt like. One of the fluorescents that hung above her head buzzed like an insect, and sometimes she would toss a pen up at it, and it would clang off the bulb, and the noise would pause for a little while. But mostly she didn't hear it. The other clerks were pacing, chatting impatiently, ready to leave. This was the part of her day when idle concern began to crystallize into spiny fear. She could keep swiping through the internet, pretending nothing was wrong, but only for a few more minutes. Soon she'd have to step out into the heat and wait for the bus and find somewhere for it to take her. She couldn't be seen around her apartment during waking hours. Evenings were minutes killed, piling up like corpses into hours. Eventually, when she would make it home, creeping through her door in the dead of night, she won't turn on any lights. A week from now, 
her landlord will toss her stuff into the alley and change the locks. Tapping around, she pulled up the profile of a guy she used to know from high school. He was on the other side of the country. It was all pictures of his new kid. You open? Out of nowhere. She'd been fiddling absently with the switch to the lamp above her lane. She flipped it back on, embarrassed, and slid her phone into the pocket of her apron. Oh, God, I'm sorry. She started, and she couldn't stop brushing at her hair. It's all right, ma'am, he replied. She can't imagine what he must have looked like back then. His overwhelming calm. That profoundly forgettable face. His most effective tool. Slow evening? Sure, she said meekly. He was only buying a few things. She wishes now she could remember what they were. Some hidden part of him must have gurgled with hunger in that moment, when they first met eyes. I'm Malcolm. She has to coast into town. The low battery light keeps flashing at her all the way up I-10. The range actually read zero for her last two miles, which meant that she'd arrived within the computer's margin for error. It would have been a pain in the ass to have to get towed. Fred would have to threaten to dock her pay. But she'd made it to Las Cruces. She backs into the receiving bay and some men open up the trailer and begin to drag the boxes out. She isn't sure what the stuff is. Maybe appliances. It's hard to say. They hook her up to temporary power as a courtesy, so she'll be able to make it to a refill station. She opens her door and steps down into the broil. There's a convenience store across the highway. She takes one more sip of lukewarm coffee and tips the rest out, splattering it across the dirt at her feet, wasting the liquor in it because there's plenty more. She swallows, sour and hollow. The asphalt ahead is incandescent with mid-morning heat. The open sign in the store's window shimmers like a mirage. Inside, She's next in line when her phone rings. Little late dropping off today, Joe. Yeah, I know. I overslept. He takes a moment to absorb the response he'd been expecting. <sighs> Joe, how can I compete with them self-drivers like this? You know they stole all my long-distance contracts. It's the best I can do to find you these piddly little one-offs the big guys won't take. I know it's not what you want. I know the pace sucks. It's not what I want either, but we gotta work with what we got. And when you can't even bother to deliver on time... Fred. She developed a way of saying his name that could knock him right out. I just... His sigh fizzes into her ear from hundreds of miles away. I know, Fred. I'm sorry. She's helped by the fact that he's even lonelier than she is, and admittedly more than a bit in love with her. Listen, you, uh, want another job? It's just a jaunt, but you can load up in a few minutes and make it back to El Paso by lunch. The sleeper in her cab is calling her name, but she agrees to take it. The guy in front of her pays and sidles out. Okay, but they need this by noon, all right? We can't screw this up. We're picking up some slack from a major service that just dropped the ball on... Pack up pods and a coffee, she says quietly. Flavor? The clerk asks without looking up. Fred is still talking into her earpiece as she digs around in her pocket for some change. 
the grape had been a terrible choice. Mm. Menthol. What? Fred, who finally stopped. Sorry, Fred. I'm at the store. Can you just text me the address? It's only like 40 miles. I can make it there by noon, I promise. 43, Joe. And really, this could lead to some much bigger stuff. They're testing us. If we can prove to these people that we can beat the big guys on these little express trips... All right, I hear you, Fred. I'm on my way to the refill now. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Really. He wants it to sound grand, effusive, compelling. But his emotion gets lost on the orbital journey through the array of satellites linking the two of them, and only the words arrive on her end. You, uh... Need anything? The coiled tail of his question outstretches invitingly. I'm good. Brushing away the implication. Hey, you hear about that girl that got killed? He continues as the sliding doors part and she steps back into the paralytic heat. Nuh-uh. They're saying serial killer. Something similar happened to a boy about her age last year in Odessa. Eleven-year-old. Pretty little thing. Psycho pulled out every hair on her body. Jolene's heart slams into the wall of her ribcage. Another gruesome child murder. Parents of Nicole Heitkamp stricken with grief. Found just outside of El Paso early Thursday morning in what authorities now suspect was a serial killing. The story is on every page of her phone. There are videos of the girl's parents. Microphones shoved in their ashen faces as they cross their mobbed front lawn. They look ordinary. But if this is what Jolene imagines, their ordinariness is the reason they had been selected for this hell. She sips a bitter mouthful from a slim plastic bottle and tosses it back behind her seat, feeling depleted. She watches the man and woman wade autonomically through the clog of neighbors they don't know and the press and the gasping February sun to get to their car to go identify their daughter's corpse. Jolene can't keep her eyes on the road. Nicole Heitkamp is the second child to be found like this. Naked, abandoned in a field, meticulously plucked of her every bodily hair. No signs of sexual abuse, the anchors keep saying, puzzled. Images of her doll-like body haven't yet been leaked. Last year's photos of the boy, nine-year-old Emmett Wilkins from Odessa, are once again everywhere. The top handful are dignifyingly blurred out, but a quick scroll reveals every inch of his bald, pallid carcass. The internet is churning through its theories, There doesn't seem to be any connection between the two children. Their families hadn't known each other. They lived almost 300 miles apart. The dad did it, people scream into their keyboards. It was a total stranger, others scream back. It was, statistically speaking, an illegal, one radio host claims, which embroils a vortex of outrage that spirals for a few hours. Ten miles to destination, her truck chirps at her. The last of the grape chokes the air. She's getting into city traffic now. She's forced to watch the road. She almost turns on the radio, but she can't stand the thought of it. To make her delivery on the east side of town, she'll pass nearby the field where the girl was found. The farther she drives the more she wants to turn around. 
but she can't do that to Fred. She'll sit tight, keep her doors locked while the men unload, and as soon as she can pull away, she'll floor it the hell out of Texas. She'd imagined all of this, of course, in endless idiosyncratic variety, all of it happening over and over to the woman in her head. Which is why this is so baffling. It isn't supposed to work this way. Nothing in her life had ever turned out the way she'd expected it to. Reality springs into place with startling disconcern for the shape you contrive for it in your mind's eye. She spends her days hurtling down the road, thumbing through her phone, glancing up only every so often, trusting the lane assist to adjust course, overcorrecting with an elbow. She's imagined flattening a family of four in a sedan, catching the first three letters of their license plate in the blink before they're pinned beneath her axle. She's envisioned the carnage, really stewed in it, becoming the woman who just mindlessly delivered these innocent four into their next life. But it won't happen. At least, not like that. That's not how life works. Expectations preclude eventualities. Then, suddenly, this, which she should have had plenty of opportunity to anticipate, is catching her entirely unprepared. Expectations preclude eventualities, don't they? How will she know how to live in a world in which they don't? Her right hand drifts habitually over to Curry's spot on the passenger seat. Jolene feels more than the full weight of her arm as it doesn't land on a mat of scruffy fur. Pressure swells against the walls of the reservoir inside of her. But then she has to slam on her brakes. She's lucky no one had been following close behind. It takes a long time to slow the big truck at speed, and by the time she can pull off to the side and switch on her hazards, she's hundreds of feet past what she thought she just saw. She steps out of the air conditioning and into the midday sun. It seems too early in the day to be so unbearable. Maybe not. It's hard to say. She doesn't spot the girl until she clears the back end of the trailer. A thin frame lilting like a swamped log, barely staying afloat. Cars are whipping by at interstate speeds, oblivious. The two make eye contact, and it's clear the girl has no energy to run. Jolene isn't sure why she'd stopped. She can't say how she'd even spotted the tiny thing, camouflaged against the roadside scrub. The girl's clothes and skin are tan with the dust that covers everything. She's a floating mop of black hair. Jolene rushes forward, catching her teetering shoulders mid-collapse. <laughs> She emptied the last baggie into the sink with the water running. She wanted to run the disposal, to listen to the grind as it rinsed down the drain, but it might wake him. I don't do this shit anymore, she had to constantly remind herself. It was hard, so hard, throwing your shoulder into the full weight of the barge trying to turn your life around. It took energy, of course, 
It took strength. But most of all, it took will. It took the endless repetition of the momentary realization that you were going somewhere. Slowly. But you weren't there yet. That you still had a terribly long way to go. But finally she had a reason. Getting clean for her own sake had never been enough. She'd never been worth it. But the press of this newness inside of her, a pea grown from nothing, it was indescribable. It made her precious. Malcolm was asleep on the couch in the other room. She crept in from the kitchen, carrying a bowl of steaming soup, fresh from the microwave. She paused in the threshold, watching the flare of his nostrils as he snored lightly. He was glassy with sweat. She wondered about his attached earlobes, her button nose. She set the bowl down on the coffee table and stroked his damp bangs gently. He shot out of sleep, eyelids twitching and frenetic, and for a moment he looked straight through her until his vision focused and he sat back, sighing. Dreaming, huh? She asked him, smiling. Malcolm never dreamt. Hi! He exhaled in three stabbing syllables. Then he matched her smile as if he'd taught himself by studying in front of a mirror. Oh, soup! Oh my God! Joey, I love soup! And he leapt into the air and squeezed her into a spin. She inflated with joy. She loved him, and right now, he loved her back. She'd learned early on never to surprise him. But so far, this was going okay. It might be time to say something. But she'd let him eat first. He lifted the bowl to his lips and began to gulp. Jesus, Malcolm, that's really hot! But he didn't seem to notice. He was impossible to pin down. He could be acutely attuned to your words and somehow totally miss their correlation with the expression on your face. She'd never seen him display the feeling of pain. <sighs> I love soup! He declared dumping the half-emptied bowl back down, cheeks dripping. He burst to his feet, nearly scraping the ceiling, scanning the room for something. Oh, let me get you a hand towel, she tisked, rethinking her plan. She could hear him pawing around for something on his hands and knees, muttering. Back in the kitchen, Clomping over the linoleum towards the stove, she felt heavy on her feet. Could she be gaining weight this early? Then his eruption rent the space. Where is it? She shouldn't have thrown the whole stash away at once. She shouldn't have made that decision for him. Too late. Her eyes darted to her exit through the back door. At 11.33 a.m., on the side of a busy highway, on the outskirts of a city in the throes of an abduction panic, Jolene slings a semi-conscious girl lightly over her shoulder and shuffles quickly back towards the open door of her truck. People in cars pass. Some notice the unusual pair. 
They all keep right on driving. Kid weighs nothing, she thinks as she heaves her up into the passenger seat. She don't even have the energy to scream. Jolene slams the door and whips around to the driver's side. Her accomplice, the truck, with its fresh battery, gives a friendly tweedle as she shifts out of park. She clamps the wheel with both of her wiry hands, and the tires skid under full torque as she stomps on the accelerator. It's most of a mile before she glances over. Passed out from heat exhaustion and slumped like a pile of laundry on the seat next to her is an illegal. It's obvious almost without looking. This poor thing has endured something nearly impossible. The thought spiders a hairline crack through her once hardened heart. No chance she'd crossed in El Paso. A well-fortified wall cleaves the border, blinding American eyes to the sprawl of Juarez, the sister city to the south. The skies above the Rio Grande swarm with drones, flitting back and forth above the heads of the armed guards lining the U.S. banks. No, much more likely she'd been shuttled in a group through the Badlands far from here, by some indifferent Moses demanding a life savings from each fare. On a hunch, Jolene assumes she'd crossed somewhere to the west, through the desert of New Mexico or Arizona. It was already 105 at noon, in what used to be winter in this part of the world. Many of those living here would vacate soon, escaping the sulfurous summer months. How far had she made it on her own? Hard to say. Jolene cranks the AC to refrigerate the cabin, looking around for something to offer the girl to drink. She prods the lump nervously with the tips of her outstretched fingers. Um, Babito? She asks, straining her Spanish already, and holding out a paper cup with this morning's still warm coffee. The girl is drifting in and out, but she recognizes the cup and grabs it, wide-eyed. She swallows it carefully, not spilling a drop, not pausing for breath. She probably ain't a Mexican, Jolene realizes, wondering how she'll ask. More likely from Central America, it isn't a given that the girl speaks Spanish, not that it would help. Before the girl can talk, before she can cry, and despite the blast of caffeine she'd just swallowed, she falls immediately backwards into a deep sleep, leaving Jolene cruising at 68 down the middle lane to decide where it is the two of them are headed. What in the world do you think you're doing? demands her mother, suddenly third in the truck. You better pick up that phone right now, punch in the directions to ice. Ma, she's a little kid, meekly, eyes downcast. Look at her. I can't believe I'm hearing this from my own daughter, a bleeding heart liberal. You want to get locked away for that little thing? Well, I don't want her to. My God, listen to you. People like you are the reason this country's down the tubes. We got laws for a reason. <coughs> Ma, she's got nothing. But Jolene is getting emotional. She's unsure of herself. She's losing her resolve. After a venomous pause. You want to nurse it back to hell? You want to find a hotel, give it a bath? Buy it new clothes. Take it away with you. <laughs> you want to pick out a new city? Send it to school with a bunch of other little brown... <laughs> Ma, you want to keep it? Because you never got your daughter. <laughs> Don't! Jolene yells out loud this time, startled that she's choking up. 
her mother, long dead, has dematerialized. She never stays away for long. The girl sleeps right through all this, sprawled across the overlarge seat like Curry used to do. The world at Jolene's periphery fades supily. Her reservoir brims, and for the first time in years, the tears come. She is crying, then sobbing, and the girl beside her slumbers unaware. By the time she shudders calm, they've passed the exit for the delivery, though she knows that's out of the question now. After a while, the girl stirs awake, petrified and silent. Jolene, gliding through her hangover, dampened, spilled out, but curiously unempty, has been practicing the pronunciation in her head. Tenga usted, uh, hombre? It seems obvious to get away from the city. Jolene takes an exit, cuts backwards, merges back on, obscuring their path, confusing their approach towards a still vague destination. She disables GPS in the truck's main menu. She turns off lane assist, guided navigation, deactivating anything in the system she imagines might be idly pinging out their current location. She isn't missing yet but soon she will be. In what she hopes will be the final transaction tied to the VIN of her truck, at least for a few days, she finds a refill station some hours south of El Paso. She parks in the farthest stall from the cashier's booth and insists, almost threateningly, into the intercom that she run the charger on her own. The attendant, enclosed in the cool, stays put, as he's told. They'll have to conserve the battery for a while, she imagines, without a true plan, as the meter whirs. This will really clip their wings. Listen to your theys, mocks her mother, but Jolene brushes away the echo. She climbs back up, waiting to unlock the doors until she can see the girl. Tiny elbows press into the seat inside, pinning their spine against the far door. Over the churn of the refiller, Jolene had been listening to her uselessly rattling the handle. They stay on the throughway just until the nearest roadside fast food. Fearing an employee's inward glance from a drive through window, Jolene once again pulls into a space at the back corner of the parking lot and steps out into the furnace. With her door still hanging open, she looks at the girl and says, Wait, what's the Spanish word for food? She pantomimes biting a sandwich, rubbing her belly, and locks the door behind her. In line, her phone vibrates for the fourth time. She flips it belatedly into airplane mode, imagining herself untraceable. Sorry, Fred. Back in the truck, the girl tears open the grease-stained paper bag, ravenous. Jolene had bought a 12-pack of waters, eight cheeseburgers, and a load of fries, as if underpacking for an apocalypse. She has to stop the girl before her third burger, afraid she'll be sick. She absorbs the look of animal scorn, saying, Later, in useless English, as she pulls away the bag. Agua, pointing at one of the bottles. They turn off the interstate in a rural direction, and most of humanity vanishes to the rear. Unable to search out a location, she has to keep straight, 
hoping to run headlong into some place to stay the night. They roll under speed through the chalky countryside, immune from the mid-afternoon swelter in their cooled, glassy pod. The thermometer outside reads 121. The nearest cloud is a week away. The girl, belly swollen, drifts in and out of a digestive nap. Once, years after her mom had died, and Malcolm had faded temporarily into her past, it had been a good day. Jolene rolled down her passenger side window. Curry jolted out of her sleepy curl, nostrils flaring in anticipation. Each morning like this was a lesson in euphoria unconstrained by language, untethered from the memory or imagination of something grander than this moment. Jolene could only glance to her right and smile, hoping to inhale some sidelong whiff of her dog's airborne elation. The blow-dryer heat of the desert air tilled channels into her fur, a rippling pattern of algorithmic beauty. Spreading the webbing of her cheeks, Curry's tongue flailed like a lost sock caught in a storm. Globules of spittle collided and absorbed and vaulted on tendrils and spun and spattered umber across the khaki endlessness of road dust and grime. Her partner hunched her graying shoulders to brace herself against the lift, lowering her head and squinting into the burst of the rising sun. She would have liked to open the windows, but for the heat. The truck is starting to stink. She'd been following roadside signs toward a motel for 25 miles, and when the bony, sun-bleached structure appears ahead, she's amazed it isn't closed down and abandoned. She parks around the back of the building. Stay a key, she tosses over her shoulder as she opens her door. Clunking down two metal steps, she feels reality's weight descend on her. Countless atmospheres of pressure press her boots to the gravel. The walk into her future feels impossibly more difficult than the drive towards it ever had. How far is she willing to take this? Under what tension will the strained fibers of her compassion tear? and float away. While rounding the corner towards the front entrance, she hears the passenger door creak open, and two tiny feet crunch into rocky soil. She'd forgotten to lock it. Oh, little idiota probably didn't even take any water. As Jolene spins and breaks into a jog, but it isn't nearly as easy to catch her as she expects. Calm breeze whips into her face like a scalding bath and down into her crusty lungs, which sputter on overdrawn breath. The sun sucks at her with parasitic persistence, and soon she's dizzy and blinking too much. 
the little girl a hundred yards ahead, hardened by weeks of this weather, scampers over a boulder her size without slowing. Como te llama? Jolene hears herself shout into the emptiness ahead before losing her wind in a fit of coughing. Come. She tries to croak, but the repetition won't come. It was true, she'd never asked the girl her name. Out of fear? But it doesn't occur to Jolene until she realizes she must launch something of a net into the growing chasm that her legs cannot narrow. Perhaps it is the oddity of her cry, billowing into the expanse of rubble that they both face, unprepared. Perhaps the girl looks up at the butane blue of the sky, the craggy lumps of dry, unsheltering land in front of her. Perhaps she looks down at her empty hands, ashamed that she has nothing and nowhere to go. A piercing silken strand leashes a motherless daughter to a daughterless mother. An invisible weight sinks its tug onto the line. Far away, the girl stops and slowly turns, keeping her head down so she won't cry. Listen, if we're going to make this work, then we're going to have to make some rules. Abandoning the pretense of communication. They are back in the truck, pulling away from the motel. Tonight they'll pick out a corner of the vast middle of nowhere ahead and sleep under the stars, far away from anything worth running towards. The sun's ferocity ebbs, but the country beneath percolates with stored energy as the toothy gears of day clack into evening. They drive thirty miles without seeing anyone. They pass an abandoned construction site, distance themselves a bit from it, and then pull off to the side. The pneumatics hiss as they slow to a crawl and then halt. Okay. Rule one. Shoving her finger in the girl's face. Intimidation had been her upbringing, and you have to start with what you know. No running. Her fingers scuttle across an open palm to demonstrate. And then she looks around. Nowhere to get. Facing the opposite way, the girl's forehead presses smudgily against her window. Jolene pulls the food bag out from behind her chair, rustling it noisily to procure her attention. The nostril-tingling aroma of chilled grease wafts into the air. Dose. Taking a deliberately softer tone and resting her hand on the girl's shoulder. It is intoxicating, touch. Using it to make an offer rather than a demand. It feels new and luxurious. Yasoi Jolene. Tapping her thumb into her own chest and looking the girl in the eye. Joe Lane. It's received with a silent blink, and the girl's attention drifts to the paper bag. Just a second, sugar. Who are you? Como me llamo. They sit a moment while the girl weighs her options. Poor thing must be only just ten. Or a severely underfed twelve. Joe Lane, she says again, prodding. Speranza. Wisps, tinily, out of her dry mouth. Speranza. Speranza. Jolene tries it, turning it over in her
her mouth. Never heard a name like that, kiddo. Where are you from? Uh, Donde, uh... The girl's eyes are watering, and Jolene doesn't want to push her too far. Her heart is overstretched, all bulgy and sore. She hands over a burger in the foil, and they eat wordlessly as the sun begins to set. After the chewing, there doesn't seem to be anything left to do. Well, there's your bed, hon, she says, pointing at the mattress behind their seats, tucked against the back wall. A lot better than I'm gonna get. She reclines her chair and makes a point of locking the doors with her key fob and pocketing it. Slowly, the girl gets up, stepping towards the back to poke the sheets, warily. Before long, she's lightly snoring in her distant accent. Jolene flips the surround cameras onto the dash screen to keep an eye on things. Meant for spotting obstacles on dark roads, their night vision is actually pretty good. The lamp of the sun swells as it plunges, and soon it's blacker than black. Of course, Jolene can't sleep. Her shoulders are sore, her ass is numb, and the kid is drooling on her only pillow. She'd once loved being lulled to sleep by the hypnotic rhythm of nearby breath. Now it's just loud in here. She smiles, but barely, embracing this. She pulls out her phone lowering its brightness and tapping past the frenzy of alerts. Fred is going berserk. There are plenty of updates to Nicole's case. Everyone in West Texas is searching for the guy, they assume. She unscrews a cap and takes a plug of whiskey. It's always some guy. Now they've tied him to five deaths, going back over twelve years. The first few they didn't even realize were related until now, but everyone is on high alert, pulling cold cases, joining the dots to form a hazy constellation around this depravity. The first they think was Javier. The name, according to a slaughterhouse worker claiming to be his uncle, A dog found a patch of bloody denim in the National Forest outside of Alamogordo back in 2017. But that was it. The DNA matched the uncle close enough to be family, but no one else came forward, and the man backed away when asked to testify. They only connected Javier because a few months later they found Osana in the same woods. Indian girl, she'd lived on the Mescalero Reservation. She was in bad shape when they found her, because they were a few months too late. But she was whole, and not a hair on her. Then, in 2021, they found Lisa. Similar situation, over west, in Carlsbad. She'd been born in the U.S. Her dad had a work permit and he'd had the gumption to press the cops when other parents would have retreated into their shock and grief. But that was almost a decade ago, and nobody would have thought much of any of it if Emmett hadn't happened, and now Nicole. He was raising the stakes, moving on to white kids. He never could back away, settle down, Jolene recalls feeling bubbly and nauseous. They won't find him until he's ready. There's something he's saying, seems like. Though she forces herself to stop before considering who he's saying it to. After she's read everything there is to read twice, she has to force her stinging eyes closed. 
She presses her phone to her chest, a poor facsimile of a partner, but her companion nonetheless. An agitated doze slinks up on her. What she knows right away is a dream. First, there is Curry, bounding through the trees. The canopy is thick and green, more of a feeling than a color. She takes off after a rabbit, and Jolene can hear them sloshing through the underbrush, and then nothing for a moment. Whimpering as she gets closer. Curry is laying there, gray around her muzzle, and her back legs won't work. It wasn't the way she'd expected, but she had expected this. The world tunnels in a new direction, and she's gone to the shed for her gun and shovel. She's serene, prepared to take the shot. Reliving it now, at this distance, is anesthesia for the spasmodic agonies of her grief. She jiggles the shed's rickety latch, and there's a clamor from within, like someone is trying to move everything out of sight. But there's no one when she wrenches it open. It reeks of preservative, foul, and close. And she can't see what she's looking at until she fumbles for the pull chain dangling from the ceiling. Then it's bright, like someone pressed unmute. Vision with your eyes is curtailed by the width of your face, but vision with your mind is an unfolding map whose center you can never reach. You keep pulling it apart. Its edges furl, too large to hold and still growing. Reliving it now, there's nothing she doesn't see. The rodents, their freshly naked bodies strewn on tables, on shelves, writhing in her hands squirming in torment past her ankles with nowhere to go. You're in his lair, and he's going to know you've been here. Maybe you can help him, comes the flash of a stupid thought. And then, with tympanic surprise, he plows in from behind. It's the trickle of cold that wakes her up. She'd been ready to turn around to face him as she never had. But from inside the shed, the rush of air didn't feel right. So she opens her eyes and sees her truck's passenger door swaying, wide open, crooning in dismay in the desert breeze in the middle of the night. Again.
occasionally a drafty whistle draws across the landscape, as if the world is hung in diorama, and the sky is the neck of a glass bottle, and the wind pulls over in a sheet, and the topography resonates at a stuck frequency that clutches her, motionless, for a while. But otherwise, the only sounds are the dragging of her feet and the rasping of her lungs. The feeble light from her phone in her left hand glints prismatically off of the contours of the pistol in her right. Her truck has gone dark, way back where she'd abandoned it. Sit. Stay. Good girl. But no way to tell it to come. Unfinished houses hunch emptily ahead. It had been a development until development stopped because of no money, no buyers, no water, no shade, because there were no longer seasons in this part of the world. If the girl is anywhere, she's in there. Jolene tries not to imagine it. It won't happen in any way she can possibly predict. The girl won't be waiting in the first house or the fifth. She won't be crouched behind a sewer pipe that never got rolled into a hole in the ground. Because it won't happen that way, she struggles to become predictionless. She knows she won't find her before he does. She can sense his proximity. She'd always been able to. He tingles like a desiccation in the back of her throat. This sense had always spoken to her with clarity, with directionality. Turn around. Go the other way. This is the first time she's ever moved toward it. Open to anything. Expecting nothing. Because expectations preclude eventualities. Back in the truck, as Jolene was bent in two, fumbling in panic for the phone she'd dropped and leering out the open door, was when it had happened. The thought collided with her, in a fission that tore the mask off of the world that had been, revealing the face of a world to come. It was so obvious that it simply couldn't be true. You just have to put their names in order. That was the way they'd been chosen, the way they'd been sequenced. Javier, Osana, Lisa, Emmett, Nicole, Esperanza. She'd thought the eight-year gap between Lisa and Emmett was significant. She'd thought their ages and races and locations were all puzzle pieces. But she'd been wrong. He wasn't trying to be clever. He wasn't trying to make history. He was just trying to talk to her. The girl's full name had come to her birthed in the thunderstrike of that moment. Not her thought at all, but his. An inception. J-O-L-E-N Esperanza. Because now she has no hope. Because he'd meant for her to be found and now she was found. So all Jolene can do is hold aloft her phone, smearing its pale blue arc in front of her, and trudge onward, and believe that because she's imagined this, it cannot be. The houses are all around her now, some of them never got walls, and the gaps in their skeletal frames 
tessellate with her pace as she looks through them to the other side. Some were almost finished the day the crews never came back, with roofs that scour through burning afternoons and sizzle all night long. Looters have torn out pipes, stolen doors, pried out windows. From inside, the occasional chirp of a smoke detector on low battery. Jolene cannot call out her name. She cannot concede fully and tumble into his world. So she crunches slowly and softly through the rows that were nearly streets, knowing that the moment she speaks, he'll emerge from the shadows. This time, she'll be ready for him. A noise, and she spins. The gun's barrel scowls in its new direction, and her back foot plants instinctively. The pressure ripples down her shoulder, into her bicep, along the crest of her forearm, and into her trigger finger. Before the squeeze, there appears in the infinity of her vision a whisker, the fuzzy clump of an ear. And curry jolts out of her sleepy curl, nostrils flaring in anticipation. Each instant like this is a lesson in euphoria, unconstrained by language, untethered from the memory or imagination of something grander than this moment. Jolene can only smile, hoping to inhale some sidelong whiff of airborne elation. This has been written and read by Episode 8, Hope to be Found. Thank you for listening. Research for this episode was brought to you by Woody. Walking all over my keyboard and swatting at all of the dangling cables were Frankie and Foster.